Part 5 of Jerusalem, the Emanation of the Giant Albion by William Blake, edited and read by Tim Bruce. To the Deists Rahab is an eternal state. The spiritual states of the soul are all eternal. Distinguish between the man and his present state. He never can be a friend to the human race who is the preacher of natural morality or natural religion. He is a flatterer who means to betray, to perpetuate tyrant pride and the laws of that Babylon which he foresees shall shortly be destroyed with a spiritual and not the natural sword. He is in the state named Rahab, which state must be put off before he can be the friend of man. You, O deists, profess yourselves the enemies of Christianity, and you are so. You are also the enemies of the human race and of universal nature. Man is born a spectre or Satan and is altogether an evil and requires a new selfhood continually and must continually be changed into his direct contrary. But your Greek philosophy, which is a remnant of Druidism, teaches that man is righteous in his vegetated spectre, an opinion of fatal and accursed consequence to man, as the ancients saw plainly by revelation to the entire abrogation of experimental theory, and many believed what they saw, and prophesied of Jesus. Man must and will have some religion. If he has not the religion of Jesus, he will have the religion of Satan, and will erect the synagogue of Satan, calling the prince of this world God, and destroying all who do not worship Satan under the name of God. Will anyone say, Where are those who worship Satan under the name of God? Where are they? Listen. Every religion that preaches vengeance for sin is the religion of the enemy and avenger, and not of the forgiver of sin. And their God is Satan, named by the divine name. Your religion, O deists, deism, is the worship of the God of this world, by the means of what you call natural religion and natural philosophy, and of natural morality or self-righteousness, the selfish virtues of the natural heart. This was the religion of the Pharisees who murdered Jesus. Deism is the same, and ends in the same. Voltaire, Rousseau, Gibbon, Hume charge the spiritually religious with hypocrisy. But how a monk or a Methodist either can be a hypocrite I cannot conceive. We are men of like passions with others, and pretend not to be holier than others. Therefore, when a religious man falls into sin, he ought not to be called a hypocrite. This title is more properly to be given to a player who falls into sin, whose profession is virtue and morality, and the making men self-righteous. Foot, in calling Whitefield hypocrite, was himself one, for Whitefield pretended not to be holier than others, but confessed his sins before all the world. Voltaire, Rousseau, you cannot escape my charge that you are Pharisees and hypocrites for you are constantly talking of the virtues of the human heart, and particularly of your own, that you may accuse others, and especially the religious, whose errors you by this display of pretended virtue chiefly design to expose. Rousseau thought men good by nature. He found them evil, and found no friend. Friendship cannot exist without forgiveness of sins continually. The book, written by Rousseau, called his Confessions, is an apology and cloak for his sin, and not a confession. But you also charge the poor monks and religious with being the causes of war, while you acquit and flatter the Alexanders and Caesars, the Lewises and Fredericks, who are alone its causes and its actors. But the religion of Jesus, forgiveness of sin, can never be the cause of a war, nor of a single martyrdom. Those who martyr others, or who cause war, are deists. 
but never can be forgivers of sin. The glory of Christianity is to conquer by forgiveness. All the destruction, therefore, in Christian Europe has arisen from deism, which is natural religion. I saw a monk of Charlemagne arise before my sight. I talked with a grey monk as we stood in beams of infernal light. Gibbon arose with a lash of steel, and Voltaire with a racking wheel. The schools in clouds of learning rolled, arose with war in iron and gold. Thou lazy monk, they sound afar, in vain condemning glorious war, and in your cell you shall ever dwell. Rise, war, and bind him in his cell. The blood red ran from the grey monk's side. His hands and feet were wounded wide. His body bent, his arms and knees, like to the roots of ancient trees. When Satan first the black bow bent, and the moral law from the gospel rent, he forged the law into a sword, and spilled the blood of mercy's lord. Titus, Constantine, Charlemagne, O Voltaire, Rousseau, Gibbon, vain your Grecian mocks and Roman sword against this image of his lord. For a tear is an intellectual thing, and a sigh is the sword of an angel king, and the bitter groan of a martyr's woe is an arrow from the Almighty's bow. Chapter 3 But Los, who is the vircid of form of strong Othona, wept vehemently over Albion, where Thames's current spring from the rivers of Beulah, Pleasant river, soft, mild, parent stream, and the roots of Albion's tree entered the soul of Los, as he sat before his furnaces clothed in sackcloth of hair, in gnawing pain dividing him from his emanation, enclosing all the children of Los time after time, their giant forms condensing into nations and peoples and tongues. Translucent the furnaces of beryl and emerald immortal, and sevenfold, each within other, incomprehensible to the vegetated mortal eyes perverted and single vision. The bellows are the animal lungs, the hammers the animal heart, the furnaces the stomach for digestion, terrible their fury like seven burning heavens ranged from south to north. Here on the banks of the Thames, Los builded Golganuza, outside the gates of the human heart, beneath Beulah, in the midst of the rocks of the altars of Albion. In fears he builded it, in rage and in fury. It is the spiritual fourfold London, continually building and continually decaying desolate. In eternal labours loud the furnaces and loud the anvils of death thunder incessant around the flaming couches of the twenty-four friends of Albion and round the awful four for the protection of the twelve emanations of Albion's sons, the mystic union of the emanation in the Lord. Because man divided from his emanation is a dark spectre, his emanation is an ever-weeping melancholy shadow but she is made receptive of generation through mercy in the potter's furnace, among the funeral urns of Beulah, from Surrey Hills through Italy and Greece to Hinnom's Vale. In great eternity, every particular form gives forth or emanates its own peculiar light, and the form is the divine vision, and the light is his garment. This is Jerusalem in every man, a tent and tabernacle of mutual forgiveness, male and female clothings. And Jerusalem is called liberty among the children of Albion. But Albion fell down, a rocky fragment from eternity hurled by his own spectre, who is the reasoning power in every man, into his own chaos, which is the memory between man and man. The silent broodings of deadly revenge, springing from the all-powerful parental affection, fills Albion from head to foot. 
seeing his sons assimilate with Luva, bound in the bonds of spiritual hate, from which springs sexual love as iron chains. He tosses like a cloud, outstretched among Jerusalem's ruins, which overspread all the earth. He groans among his ruined porches. But the spectre, like a hoar-frost and a mildew, rose over Albion, saying, I am God, O sons of men! I am your rational power! Am I not Bacon and Newton and Locke who teach humility to man? Who teach doubt and experiment? And my two wings, Voltaire, Rousseau? Where is that friend of sinners, that rebel against my laws, who teaches belief to the nations in an unknown eternal life? Come hither into the desert and turn these stones to bread. Vain, foolish man. Wilt thou believe without experiment and build a world of fantasy upon my great abyss? A world of shapes in craving lust and devouring appetite. So spoke the hard, cold, constrictive spectre. He is named Arthur, constricting into druid rocks round Canaan, Agag, and Aram and Pharaoh. Then Albion drew England into his bosom in groans and tears, but she stretched out her starry night in spaces against him, like a long serpent in the abyss of the spectre, which augmented the night with dragon wings covered with stars, and in the wings Jerusalem and valour appeared. And above, between the wings magnificent, the divine vision dimly appeared in clouds of blood weeping. When those who disregard all mortal things saw a mighty one, among the flowers of Beulah still retain his awful strength, they wondered, checking their wild flames, and many gathering together into an assembly, they said, Let us go down and see these changes. Others said, If you do so, prepare for being driven from our fields. What have we to do with the dead? To be their inferiors or superiors we equally abhor. Superior? None we know. Inferior? None. All equals share divine benevolence and joy, for the eternal man walketh among us, calling us his brothers and his friends, forbidding us that veil which Satan puts between Eve and Adam, by which the princes of the dead enslave their votaries, teaching them to form the serpent of precious stones and gold, to seize the sons of Jerusalem and plant them in one man's loins, to make one family of contraries, that Joseph may be sold into Egypt for negation. A veil, the Saviour born and dying, rends. But others said, Let us to him who only is, and who walketh among us give decision. Bring forth all your fires. So saying, an eternal deed was done. In fiery flames the universal concave raged, such thunderous sounds as never was sounded from a mortal cloud, nor on Mount Sinai old, nor in Havilah, where the cherub rolled his redounding flame. Loud, loud the mountains lifted up their voices, loud the forest's rivers thundered against their banks, loud winds furious fought, cities and nations contended in fires and clouds and tempests, the seas raised up their voices and lifted their hands on high. The stars in their concourse fought. The sun, the moon, heaven, earth, contending for Albion and for Jerusalem his emanation, and for Shiloh, the emanation of France, and for lovely valour. Then far the greatest number were about to make a separation, and they elected seven, called the seven eyes of God, Lucifer. Moloch, Elohim, Shaddai, Pahad, Jehovah, Jesus. They named the eighth. He came not. He hid in Albion's forests. But first they said, and their words stood in chariots in array, curbing their tigers with golden bits and bridles of silver and ivory. Let the human organs be kept in their perfect integrity. 
at will contracting into worms or expanding into gods. And then, behold, what are these ulro visions of chastity? Then, as the moss upon the tree, or dust upon the plough, or as the sweat upon the labouring shoulder, or as the chaff of the wheat floor, or as the dregs of the sweet wine press, such are these ulro visions. For though we sit down within the ploughed furrow, listening to the weeping clods till we contract or expand space at will, or if we raise ourselves upon the chariots of the morning, contracting or expanding time, every one knows we are one family, one man blessed for ever. Silence remained, and every one resumed his human majesty, and many conversed on these things as they laboured at the furrow, saying, It is better to prevent misery than to release from misery. It is better to prevent error than to forgive the criminal. Labour well the minute particulars, attend to the little ones, and those who are in misery cannot remain so long if we do but our duty. Labour well the teeming earth. They ploughed in tears. The trumpets sounded before the golden plough, and the voices of the living creatures were heard in the clouds of heaven, crying, Compel the reasoner to demonstrate with unhewn demonstrations. Let the indefinite be explored, and let every man be judged by his own works. Let all indefinites be thrown into demonstrations, to be pounded to dust and melted in the furnaces of affliction. He who would do good to another must do it in minute particulars. General good is the plea of the scoundrel, hypocrite, and flatterer, for art and science cannot exist but in minutely organized particulars, and not in generalizing demonstrations of the rational power. The infinite alone resides in definite and determinate identity. Establishment of truth depends on destruction of falsehood continually, on circumcision, not on virginity, O reasoners of Albion. So cried they at the plough. Albion's rock frowned above, and the great voice of eternity rolled above terrible in clouds, saying, Who will go forth for us? Who shall we send before our face? Then Los heaved his thundering bellows on the valley of Middlesex, and thus he chanted his song. The daughters of Albion reply, what may man be? Who can tell? But what may woman be to have power over man from cradle to corruptible grave? He who is an infant, and whose cradle is a manger, knoweth the infant's sorrow, whence it came and where it goeth. And who weave it a cradle of the grass that withereth away? This world is all a cradle for the erred wandering phantom, rocked by year, month, day and hour, and every two moments between dwells a daughter of Beulah to feed the human vegetable. In tune, daughters of Albion, your hymning chorus mildly, chord of affection thrilling ecstatic on the iron reel to the golden loom of love, to the moth-laboured woof, a garment and cradle weaving for the infantine terror, for fear, at entering the gate into our world of cruel lamentation, it flee back and hide in nonentities dark wild, where dwells the spectre of Albion, destroyer of definite form. The sun shall be a scythed chariot of Britain, the moon a ship in the British ocean, created by Losi's hammer, measured out into days and nights and years and months, to travel with my feet over these desolate rocks of Albion. O oh, daughters of despair, rock the cradle, and in mild melodies tell me where found what you have inwoven with so much tears and care, so much tender artifice, to laugh, to weep, to learn, to know. Remember, recollect, what dark befell in wintry days. Oh, it was lost for ever, and we found it not. It came and wept at our wintry door. Look, 
Look, behold, Gwendolyn is become a clod of clay. Merlin is the worm of the valley. Then Los uttered with hammer and anvil. Chant, revoice. I mind not your laugh, and your frown I not fear, and you must my dictate obey. From your gold-beamed looms trill gentle to Albion's watchman, on Albion's mountains re-echo, and rock the cradle. While, ah me, of that eternal man, and of the cradled infancy in his bowels of compassion, who fell beneath his instruments of husbandry, and became subservient to the clods of the furrow, the cattle, and even the emmet and earthworm are his superiors and his lords. Then the response came, warbling from trilling looms in Albion. We women tremble at the light, therefore hiding fearful the divine vision with curtain and veil and fleshy tabernacle. Los uttered, swift as the rattling thunder upon the mountains. Look back into the church, Paul, look. Three women around the cross. O oh, Albion, why didst thou a female will create? And the voices of Bath and Canterbury and York and Edinburgh cry over the plough of nations in the strong hand of Albion thundering along among the fires of the Druid and the deep black rethundering waters of the Atlantic, which poured in, impetuous, loud, loud, louder and louder, and the great voice of the Atlantic howled over the druid altars, weeping over his children in Stonehenge, in Malden and Colchester, round the rocky peak of Derbyshire, London Stone and Rosamond's Bower. What is a wife and what is a harlot? What is a church and what is a theatre? Are they two and not one? Can they exist separate? Are not religion and politics the same thing? Brotherhood is religion. O oh, demonstrations of reason, dividing families in cruelty and pride. But Albion fled from the divine vision with a plough of nations inflaming, the living creatures maddened, and Albion fell into the furrow, and the plough went over him, and the living was ploughed in among the dead. But his spectre rose over the starry plough. Albion fled beneath the plough till he came to the rock of ages, and he took his seat upon the rock. Wonder seized all in eternity, to behold the divine vision open the centre into an expanse, and the centre rolled out into an expanse. In beauty, the daughters of Albion divide and unite at will, naked and drunk with blood. Gwendolyn, dancing to the timbrel of war, reeling up the street of London, she divides in twain among the inhabitants of Albion. The people fall around. The daughters of Albion divide and unite in jealousy and cruelty. The inhabitants of Albion at the harvest and the vintage feel their brain cut round beneath the temples, shrieking, bonifying into a skull, the marrow exuding in dismal pain. They flee over the rocks, bonifying. Horses, oxen feel the knife, and while the sons of Albion by severe war and judgment bonify, the hermaphroditic condensations are divided by the knife. The obdurate forms are cut asunder by jealousy and pity. Rational philosophy and mathematic demonstration is divided in the intoxications of pleasure and affection. Two contraries war against each other in fury and blood, and Los fixes them on his anvil, incessant his blows. He fixes them with strong blows, placing the stones and timbers to create a world of generation from the world of death, dividing the masculine and feminine, for the commingling of Albion's and Louvre's spectres was hermaphroditic. Urizen, wrathful, strode above, directing the awful building as a mighty temple, delivering form out of confusion. Jordan sprang beneath its threshold, bubbling from beneath its pillars. 
Euphrates ran under its arches, white sails and silver oars reflect on its pillars and sound on its echoing pavements where walk the sons of Jerusalem, who remain ungenerate. But the revolving sun and moon pass through its porticos day and night in sublime majesty and silence they revolve and shine glorious within. Hand and Coburn arced over the sun in the hot noon as he travelled through his journey. Hyle and Schofield arced over the moon at midnight, and Lowe's fixed them there with his thunderous hammer. Terrified, the spectres rage and flee. Canaan is his portico. Jordan is a fountain in his porch, a fountain of milk and wine to relieve the traveller. Egypt is the eight steps within. Ethiopia supports his pillars. Libya and the lands unknown are the ascent without. Within is Asia and Greece, ornamented with exquisite art. Persia and Media are his halls. His inmost hall is great Tartary. China and India and Siberia are his temples for entertainment. Poland and Russia and Sweden, his soft retired chambers. France and Spain and Italy and Denmark and Holland and Germany are the temples among his pillars. Britain is Lose's forge. America north and south are his baths of living waters. Such is the ancient world of Eurizen in the satanic void created from the valley of Middlesex by London's river from Stonehenge and from London stone from Cornwall to Caithness. The four Zoas rush around on all sides in dire ruin. Furious in pride of selfhood, the terrible spectres of Albion rear their dark rocks among the stars of God, stupendous works. A world of generation continually creating, out of the hermaphroditic satanic world of rocky destiny, and formed into four precious stones for entrance from Beulah. For the veil of valour, which Albion cast into the Atlantic deep to catch the souls of the dead, began to vegetate and petrify around the earth of Albion, among the roots of his tree. This Los formed into the gate and mighty wall between the oak of weeping and the palm of suffering beneath Albion's tomb. Thus, in process of time, it became the beautiful mundane shell, the habitation of the spectres of the dead, and the place of redemption, and of awaking again into eternity. For four universes round the mundane egg remain chaotic, one to the north, Uthona, one to the south, Eurizen, one to the east, Luva, one to the west, Tharmas. They are the four Zoas that stood around the throne divine, Verulam, London, York, and Edinburgh, their English names. But when Luva assumed the world of Eurizen southward, and Albion was slain upon his mountains and in his tent, all fell towards the centre, sinking downwards in dire ruin. In the south remains a burning fire, in the east a void, in the west a world of raging waters, in the north, solid darkness, unfathomable, without end. But in the midst of these is built eternally the sublime universe of Los and Anithamon. And in the north gate, in the west of the north, toward Beulah, Cathedron's looms are builded, and Los's furnaces in the south. A wondrous golden building, immense with ornaments sublime, is bright cathedron's golden hall, its courts, towers, and pinnacles. And one daughter of Lowe's sat at the fiery reel, and another sat at the shining loom, with her sisters attending round. Terrible, their distress and their sorrow cannot be uttered. And another daughter of Lowe's sat at the spinning wheel, endless their labour, with bitter food, void of sleep. Though hungry, they labour, they rouse themselves anxious hour after hour labouring at the whirling wheel, many wheels, 
and as many lovely daughters sit weeping. Yet the intoxicating delight that they take in their work obliterates every other evil. None pities their tears, yet they regard not pity, and they expect no one to pity. For they labour for life and love, regardless of anyone but the poor spectres that they work for always, incessantly. They are mocked by everyone that passes by. They regard not, they labour. And when their wheels are broken by scorn and malice, they mend them sorrowing with many tears and afflictions. Other daughters weave on the cushion and pillow, Network fine that Rahab and Tirza may exist and live and breathe and love. Ah, that it could be as the daughters of Beulah wish. Other daughters of Los, labouring at looms less fine, create the silkworm and the spider and the caterpillar to assist in their most grievous work of pity and compassion. And others create the woolly lamb and the downy fowl to assist in the work. The lamb bleats, the sea fowl cries. Men understand not the distress and the labour and sorrow that in the interior worlds is carried on in fear and trembling, weaving the shuddering fears and loves of Albion's families. Thunderous rage the spindles of iron, and the iron distaff maddens in the fury of their hands, weaving in bitter tears the veil of goat's hair and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. The clouds of Albion's druid temples rage in the eastern heaven, while Lo sat terrified, beholding Albion's spectre, who is Luva, spreading in bloody veins in torments over Europe and Asia, not yet formed, but a wretched torment, unformed and abyssal, in flaming fire. Within the furnaces, the divine vision appeared on Albion's hills, often walking from the furnaces in clouds and flames among the druid temples and the starry wheels, gathered Jerusalem's children in his arms, and bore them like a shepherd in the night of Albion, which overspread all all the earth. I gave thee liberty and life, O lovely Jerusalem, and thou hast bound me down upon the stems of vegetation. I gave thee sheep walks upon the Spanish mountains, Jerusalem. I gave thee Priam city and the isles of Grecia lovely. I gave thee Hand and Schofield and the counties of Albion. They spread forth like a lovely root into the garden of God. They were as Adam before me, united into one man. They stood in innocence, and their skyey tent reached over Asia to Nimrod's tower, to Ham and Canaan, walking with Mizraim upon the Egyptian Nile, with solemn songs to Grecia and sweet Hesperia, even to great Chaldea and Teshina, following thee as a shepherd by the four rivers of Eden. Why wilt thou rend thyself apart, Jerusalem, and build this Babylon and sacrifice in secret groves, among the gods of Asia, among the fountains of pitch and nitre? Therefore thy mountains are become barren, Jerusalem, thy valleys plains of burning sand, thy rivers waters of death, Thy villages die of the famine, and thy cities beg bread from house to house. Lovely Jerusalem, why wilt thou deface thy beauty and the beauty of thy little ones to please thy idols in the pretended chastities of uncircumcision? Thy sons are lovelier than Egypt or Assyria. Wherefore dost thou blacken their beauty by a secluded place of rest, and a peculiar tabernacle, to cut the integuments of beauty into veils of tears and sorrows, O lovely Jerusalem? They have persuaded thee to this, therefore their end shall come, and I will lead thee through the wilderness in shadow of my cloud, 
and in my love I will lead thee, lovely shadow of sleeping Albion. This is the song of the Lamb, sung by slaves in evening time. But Jerusalem faintly saw him, closed in the dungeons of Babylon, her form was held by Beulah's daughters, but all within, unseen, she sat at the mills, her hair unbound, her feet naked, cut with the flints, her tears run down, her reason grows like the wheel of hand, incessant turning day and night without rest. Insane she raves upon the winds, hoarse, inarticulate, all night valour hears. She triumphs in pride of holiness to see Jerusalem deface her lineaments with bitter blows of despair, while the satanic holiness triumphed in valour, in the religion of chastity and uncircumcised selfishness, both of the head and heart and loins closed up in moral pride. But the divine Lamb stood beside Jerusalem. Oft she saw the lineaments divine, and oft the voice heard, and oft she said, O Lord and Saviour, have the gods of the heathen pierced thee? Or hast thou been pierced in the house of thy friends? Art thou alive, and livest thou for evermore? Or art thou not, but a delusive shadow, a thought that liveth not? Babel mocks, saying there is no God, nor Son of God, that thou, O human imagination, O divine body, art all a delusion. But I know thee, O Lord, when thou arisest upon my weary eyes, even in this dungeon and this iron mill, the stars of Albion cruel rise. Thou bindest to sweet influences, for thou also sufferest with me although I behold thee not. And although I sin and blaspheme thy holy name, thou pitiest me, because thou knowest I am deluded by the turning mills, and by these visions of pity and love because of Albion's death. Thus spake Jerusalem, and thus the divine voice replied, Mild shade of man, Pityest thou these visions of terror and woe? Give forth thy pity and love, fear not. Lo, I am with thee always. Only believe in me, that I have power to raise from death thy brother who sleepeth in Albion. Fear not, trembling shade. Behold, in the visions of Elohim Jehovah, Behold Joseph and Mary, and be comforted, O Jerusalem, in the visions of Jehovah Elohim. She looked, and saw Joseph the carpenter in Nazareth, and Mary his espoused wife. And Mary said, If thou put me away from thee, dost thou not murder me? Joseph spoke in anger and fury. Should I marry a harlot and an adulteress? Mary answered, Art thou more pure than thy Maker, who forgiveth sins, and calls her again that is lost? Though she hates, he calls her again in love. I love my dear Joseph, but he driveth me away from his presence. Yet I hear the voice of God in the voice of my husband. Though he is angry for a moment, he will not utterly cast me away. If I were pure, Never could I taste the sweets of the forgiveness of sins. If I were holy, I could never behold the tears of love of him who loves me in the midst of his anger in furnace of fire. Oh, my Mary, said Joseph, weeping over and embracing her closely in his arms. Doth he forgive Jerusalem and not exact purity from her who is polluted? I heard his voice in my sleep, and his angel in my dream, saying, Doth Jehovah forgive a debt only on condition that it shall be paid? Doth he forgive pollution only on conditions of purity? That debt is not forgiven. That pollution is not forgiven. 
Such is the forgiveness of the gods, the moral virtues of the heathen, whose tender mercies are cruelty. But Jehovah's salvation is without money and without price, in the continual forgiveness of sins, in the perpetual mutual sacrifice in great eternity. For behold, there is none that liveth and sinneth not, and this is the covenant of Jehovah. If you forgive one another, so shall Jehovah forgive you, that he himself may dwell among you. Fear not then to take to thee Mary thy wife, for she is with child by the Holy Ghost. Then Mary burst forth into a song. She flowed like a river of many streams in the arms of Joseph, and gave forth her tears of joy like many waters and emanating into gardens and palaces upon Euphrates, and to forests, and floods, and animals wild and tame, from Gihon to Hiddekel, and to cornfields and villages, and inhabitants upon Pison and Arnon and Jordan. And I heard the voice among the reapers saying, Am I Jerusalem the lost adulteress? Or am I Babylon come up to Jerusalem? And another voice answered, saying, Does the voice of my Lord call me again? Am I pure through his mercy and pity? Am I become lovely as a virgin in his sight, who am indeed a harlot drunken with the sacrifice of idols? Does he call her pure as he did in the days of her infancy, when she was cast out to the loathing of her person? The Chaldean took me from my cradle. The Amalekite stole me away upon his camels before I had ever beheld with love the face of Jehovah or known that there was a God of mercy. O oh, mercy, O oh, divine humanity, O oh, forgiveness and pity and compassion! If I were pure, I should never have known thee. If I were unpolluted, I should never have glorified thy holiness or rejoiced in thy great salvation. Mary leaned her side against Jerusalem. Jerusalem received the infant in her hands in the visions of Jehovah. Times passed on. Jerusalem fainted over the cross and sepulchre. She heard the voice. Wilt thou make Rome thy patriarch druid and the kings of Europe his horsemen? Man in the resurrection changes his sexual garments at will. Every harlot was once a virgin, every criminal an infant love. Repose on me till the morning of the grave. I am thy life. Jerusalem replied, I am an outcast. Albion is dead. I am left to the trampling foot and the spurning heel. A harlot I am called. I am sold from street to street. I am defaced with blows and with the dirt of the prison. And wilt thou become my husband, O oh, my Lord and Saviour? Shall valour bring thee forth? Shall the chaste be ashamed also? I see the maternal line. I behold the seed of the woman, Cana and Ada, and Zillah, and Nama, wife of Noah, Shua's daughter, and Tamar, and Rahab, the Canaanites, Ruth, the Moabite, and Bathsheba, of the daughters of Heth, Nama, the Ammonite, Zibiah, the Philistine, and Mary, these are the daughters of Valor, mother of the body of death. But I, thy Magdalene, behold thy spiritual risen body. Shall Albion arise? I know he shall arise at the last day. I know that in my flesh I shall see God. But emanations are weak, they know not whence they are, nor with attend. Jesus replied, I am the resurrection and the life. I die and pass the limits of possibility, as it appears to individual perception. Luva must be created and valor, for I cannot leave them in the gnawing grave, 
but I will prepare a way for my banished ones to return. Come now, with me into the villages. Walk through all the cities. Though thou art taken to prison and judgment, starved in the streets, I will command the cloud to give thee food, and the hard rock to flow with milk and wine. Though thou seest me not a season, even a long season, and a hard journey, and a howling wilderness, though valor's cloud hide thee, and Luva's fires follow thee, only believe and trust in me. Lo, I am always with thee. So spoke the Lamb of God, while Luva's cloud, reddening above, burst forth in streams of blood upon the heavens, and dark night involved Jerusalem, and the wheels of Albion's sons turned horse over the mountains, and the fires blazed on druid altars, and the sun set in Tyburn's brook, where victims howl and cry. But Los beheld a divine vision among the flames of the furnaces, Therefore he lived and breathed in hope, but his tears fell incessant, because his children were closed from him apart, and Onithamon dividing in fierce pain. Also the vision of God was closed in clouds of Albion's spectres, that Los in despair oft sat, and often pondered on death eternal, in fierce shudders upon the mountains of Albion walking, and in the vales of howlings fierce. Then to his anvils turning, anew began his labours, though in terrible pains. Jehovah stood among the Druids in the valley of Annandale, when the four Zoas of Albion, the four living creatures, the cherubim of Albion, trembled before the spectre in the starry harness of the plough of nations, and their names are Eurizen, and Luva, and Tharmas, and Orthona. Luva slew Tharmas, the angel of the tongue, and Albion brought him to justice in his own city of Paris, denying the resurrection. Then Vala, the wife of Albion, who is the daughter of Luva, took vengeance twelvefold among the chaotic rocks of the Druids, where the human victims howl to the moon, and Thor and Frigga dance the dance of death, contending with Jehovah among the cherubim. The chariot wheels, filled with eyes, rage along the howling valley in the dividing of Reuben and Benjamin, bleeding from Chester's river. The giants and the witches and the ghosts of Albion dance with Thor and Frigga, and the fairies lead the moon along the valley of Cherubim, bleeding in torrents from mountain to mountain, a lovely victim. And Jehovah stood in the gates of the victim, and he appeared, a weeping infant, in the gates of birth, in the midst of heaven. The cities and villages of Albion became rock and sand unhumanized, the druid sons of Albion, and the heavens a void around, unfathomable, no human form but sexual, and a little weeping infant pale reflected multitudinous in the looking-glass of Anithomon, on all sides around in the clouds of the female, on Albion's cliffs of the dead, such the appearance in Cheviot, in the divisions of Reuben, when the cherubim hid their heads under their wings in deep slumbers, when the druids demanded chastity from woman, and all was lost. How can the female be chaste, O thou stupid druid? cried Los, without the forgiveness of sins in the merciful clouds of Jehovah and without the baptism of repentance to wash away calumnies and the accusations of sin that each may be pure in their neighbour's sight. O oh, when shall Jehovah give us victims from his flocks and herds instead of human victims by the daughters of Albion and Canaan? Then laughed Gwendolen, and her laughter shook the nations and families of the dead beneath Beulah from Tyburn to Golgotha, and from Ireland to Japan. 
furious her lions and tigers and wolves sport before Los on the Thames and Medway. London and Canterbury groan in pain. Los knew not yet what was done. He thought it was all in vision, in visions of the dreams of Beulah among the daughters of Albion. Therefore the murder was put apart in the looking-glass of Onithamon. He saw in Valor's hand the druid knife of revenge and the poison cup of jealousy, and thought it a poetic vision of the atmospheres, till Canaan rolled apart from Albion across the Rhine along the Danube, and all the land of Canaan suspended over the valley of Cheviot, from Bashan to Tyre, and from Troy to Gaza of the Amalekite. And Reuben fled with his head downwards among the caverns of the mundane shell, which froze on all sides round Canaan on the vast expanse, where the daughters of Albion weave the web of ages and generations, folding and unfolding it like a veil of cherubim. And sometimes it touches the earth's summits, and sometimes spreads abroad into the indefinite spectre, who is the rational power. Then all the daughters of Albion became one before Los, even Valor, and she put forth her hand upon the looms in dreadful howlings till she vegetated into a hungry stomach and a devouring tongue. Her hand is a court of justice, her feet two armies in battle, storms and pestilence in her locks, and in her loins earthquake and fire and the ruin of cities and nations and families and tongues. She cries, the human is but a worm, and thou, O oh male, thou art thyself female, a male, a breeder of seed, a son and husband, and lo, the human divine is woman shadow, a vapour in the summer's heat. Go assume papal dignity, thou spectre, thou male harlot. Arthur, divide into the kings of Europe in times remote, O oh, woman born, and woman nourished, and woman educated, and woman scorned. Wherefore art thou living, said Los, and man cannot live in thy presence? Art thou Valor, the wife of Albion, O thou lovely daughter of Luva? All quarrels arise from reasoning, the secret murder, and the violent manslaughter, these are the spectre's double cave, the sexual death living on accusation of sin and judgment, to freeze love and innocence into the gold and silver of the merchant. Without forgiveness of sin, love is itself eternal death. Here ends Part 5 of Jerusalem, The Emanation of the Giant Albion by William Blake.